Good afternoon, everyone. Um, relaying fragile risk is difficult for local officials. It is also hard for citizens to understand, especially if their home has never flooded before. These are the products that we produce as part of a FEMA map update. You will notice the traditional regulatory products and then the new flood risk products are both on the screen. The flood risk data set and products um, are the newest information that we are producing. They are provided in a GIS format, making them more user friendly. These products help a local official articulate flood risks to their citizens. Citizens want to hear about flood risk from the local officials. They don't really care to hear about it from the state or the federal government. They want to hear it from the people that they go to church with, in the grocery store with, the people they see in their community that are know, that they know have a vested interest in their safety. In South Carolina, back in October of 2015, we had a flood event. It was a large rain event that produced the flooding for most of the state. Um, the rivers in this impacted area um, are whitewater rivers that are fast moving and they only take hours to peak. Um, some of these flood risk data sets we were able to use after the fact, mainly helping citizens and community officials understand their true level of flood risk. So here's one of those data sets. It's actually called a depth grid. And the, it indicates the expected depth of water in a particular area. And when using these grids, you can relay to a citizen how deep the water will be when they step out of their front door. If you happen to have floor elevations for a structure, you can indicate how deep the water will be inside the building. You can see at this particular point, the depth is 5.1 feet. We were able to go out to this structure and take some photographs. And as you can see from where the water lines are indicated by the arrows, it's approximately five feet above the ground. We also have what's called velocity grids. This is another data set that's produced as part of the flood risk products. And they indicate how fast the water is moving. So if we go to this particular spot, you will see that the water is moving at 11.6 um, feet per second, and that is approximately 7.5 miles per hour. Now let's look at what kind of damage that water can do. You see this house? Um, you can see part of the veneer on the outside is damaged, and as we flow through the pictures, you'll be able to see some other damage. You will notice cars. These cars actually floated downstream from a community upstream of this community. They do not belong to anyone that lives in the immediate area. So water alone can cause large scale damage as you saw from the front of the house. This is that same house. But also the debris that the water is carrying also can do a large amount of damage. This is another house. This is actually right next door to the house I just showed you. And it has significant damage. It actually, as you notice, um, there's something missing here. It's actually the garage. And the garage was found across the lake. So if you look in the um, picture at the bottom, that pile of rubble below the trees that you can barely see, that's the garage from this house. So it was completely taken off the house and deposited across the lake. Then we got lucky again in October of 2016 to have Hurricane Matthew impact the state. And as it began to fall apart as it moved through South Carolina, it dumped a large amount of rainwater over the PD region of South Carolina and eastern North Carolina. Um, quite a few Blackwater rivers are present in the, this area, and these type of rivers take days to peak. Also, it's a complex river system that has the ability to create backwater along some of the rivers. Also, as the water was moving downstream toward Winya Bay, to, towards the ocean, king tides rolled in, adding another impediment to the relief of the flooded areas that was so desperately needed. So what did we do this time? We took a little different approach with this event since we had more time to assist. The water was rising a little slower, so we had a little more time to create an inundation map. So we created this in ArcGIS. While it was great for those of us that were sitting in the office, it was kind of hard for people to view out in the field. So um, these are kind of not ideal to produce on the fly. It's better to have it ahead of the event. We didn't have that advantage this time. but So we created this, and then what did we do with it? We started sharing it. The first place we shared it, because there was our first priority, was keeping our 
law enforcement officers safe out in the field so they could help citizens was we shared it with law enforcement. But we noticed that it was too complicated for them to use in the field just having an iPhone. So we actually created this PDF and actually told them where to go based off of the information and gave them their access points so they could get to people faster. And this was much easier for them to read in the field. We also provided the information to our local floodplain managers. This is an example of the city of Georgetown. If we look at this particular point, um, you will notice that how the impacted area was with the inundation and then our floodplain manager was kind enough to go out there and take a picture to show that our map was pretty accurate in this area as far as the amount of area that was inundated. We also have an issue here being part of the Department of Natural Resources. Um, we deal with the closure of deer season. Well, during a flooding event, deer move to higher ground and cluster in groups, giving hunters an unfair advantage. So we supplied our inundation map to assist our Wildlife and Freshwater Fisheries Division in closing deer season. We also provided the same kind of information um, during the 2015 flood event. It wasn't an inundation map, but we did tell them what areas were inundated and where flooding was occurring. So we assisted in the closure as well back in 2015. SCDOT got word of our inundation map and called and asked if we would share the information. Of course we did, and they were able to use the information to determine what roads needed to be closed. Here are our lessons learned. We wanted to make sure information is a format that can be understood by your intended audience, whether it's a local floodplain manager, a law enforcement officer, a government official, the governor, that whatever we produce can be understood and is put in the correct format. Um, no matter what you do, everyone will not leave. So you're always going to have that um, information to try to, ahead of time, let people know what their level of risk is and hopefully they will leave or you have a limited number that you're having to rescue. And then of course public perception. In 2015 we were out rescuing people, the water was coming up quick and people were trapped in their homes. In 2016 we were able to actually get them out by truck versus by boat. So we were able to help assist in actually evacuating versus rescuing. So the public perception part of this is that the 2015 photo that you see has a bigger impact on what you're doing even though the 2016 photo actually has people safer. They were evacuated ahead of the flooding rather than after the flooding had already occurred. So where do we go from here? This is what we're planning to do in South Carolina. It's actually a uh, web-based application that will monitor, assess, and communicate real-time flood risk. Um, so two basic inundation approaches is basically at the USGS gauges we'd be able to um, build inundation libraries that would pull out based on what the gauge is reporting and then in between them there is another um, flood risk data set called a percent annual chance that connects between those two and can draw in between making it seamless and being able to produce a map that would be able to be used by law enforcement, by citizens, by public officials to make information available to do evacuations, rescues, closing of roads, anything along those lines. So we've been trying to automate our system rather than having to pump it out via email or um, FTP site. So we're trying to do something along the lines of a web-based application. Thank you.